Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, oh, welcome to episode 156 of the Spears Sunnies podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears, stand-up comedian, long cunt in general, and uh, man, I, good mood, bro. The comedy festival's on, I've been performing heaps, I'm not doing my own show, I'm touring in September, stop asking me. Um, but I've just been opening for a bunch of people, so hey, man, if you if you see a couple of my mates, you never know, I may pop up. Um... It's uh, been really, really good, man. Jeez, it's been a while since we've spoken, haven't we? Before I get into it, I wanted to say that uh, uh, episode three of the Me and Mike podcast just went up on Patreon. It is a Patreon-only podcast because I want to give back to you guys who support me. I'm buying all this new gear, which is fucking awesome since the Patreon support jumped up. Got my editor in three days a week instead of two. It's all really, really cool stuff that's happening. Uh, so I wanted to give back to the Patreon folks. And uh, the best way to do that is with some exclusive content. So episode three of the Me and Mike podcast, which is a podcast that myself and Radio Mike are doing, is up right now. Uh, go and get it. It's on patreon.com slash Spears. And no matter how much you pledge uh, your support, even if it's a dollar to ten bucks to whatever the fuck you, you want to chuck in, you get the podcast in full and it's video and audio and it's fucking very funny. I'm going to play a short clip of it at the end of this episode so you guys can get a, a gist of it. And, and episode one is up for free uh, if you want to go through my podcast channel uh, how, on whatever platform you listen to. You can uh, watch or listen to that. Okay, that's enough plugging. Um, man, it's uh, been a while since just you and I have talked, huh? I've had a, had a lot of guests on. Always have a lot of guests on when the comedy festival is happening, which is cool. Um, but uh, I do miss I do miss our little solo chats. You know, I feel like uh, I feel like a, a couple that has just started dipping their toes into into polyamory. You know, fucking other people, having an open relationship, but then they've like exclusively been having threesomes and fucking other people, and then they just don't know how to enjoy sex with themselves, just by themselves. You know, I feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I would know. Um, man, what about what? Have, dude, I saw. I did the coolest shit. Actually, sorry, scratch that. Not cool at all. Fucking embarrassing and very lame. But I absolutely loved it, and that's all that matters. Okay. Mm, not all of the time. I would say in sex situations, you probably want everyone to be involved. <laughs> Um, but man, I did I did the coolest shit. I went to uh, a a movie cinema and I saw a silent film. I know sounds lame from the nineteen twenties. Okay, sounds even lamer. But okay, here's a cool bit. They did it exactly the same as how they used to do it in the nineteen twenties. So they had a Wurlitzer there, and a Wurlitzer is it's I can't even explain the instrument, man. It's what they used to play to have the music and the sound effects. Uh, for the silent films in the 1920s when they were coming out, right? Before sound was in movies. It was so fucking cool. This instrument, it's like a piano, but it has three fucking keyboard things. And then it has probably 300 buttons that go in an arc from the bottom of the thing in a semicircle above those three fucking keyboards. And then he also has bells and whistles that he pulls from little levers and then his feet, he is, he is pumping air or something, I think it was pumping air, into the system so that it worked and the sounds would come out. And then with his left foot, he's playing bass notes. He's got all of these little keys on the floor going, dun, 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 and it's built into the fucking cinema, right? So that the sound, it's not amplified in any way. It's in the walls. And this dude was, was playing the sound effects and the music while watching the movie live. It was so fucking cool. It was just like how they used to do movies in the 1920s. I saw it at uh, Dendy Cinemas in Bentley. I think they do it once a month. Um, but there, apparently there's some massive like nationwide Wurlitzer uh, community where a bunch of people... like The dude flew down from Brisbane to do it. So I imagine there's one in Brisbane because it's the kind of instrument you can't learn it at home. For that cunt to learn it, he would have to go to the cinema and just sit there with nobody else there and learn how to play it. Effectively, he was playing six pianos at once with his hands and his feet. It was absolutely incredible. And he was doing it live while watching the movie. So this dude is, is, is playing three different keyboards, the bass notes on his feet, hitting sound effects, bells and whistles while watching a movie. 
and doing it in time with the characters. It was fucking incredible to see. And it was really, really cool to see like uh, just the, the, the genesis of filmed comedy. You know what I mean? Like that's how it was created. That was the first ever comedies. What did I say? I saw, um, oh no, I can't remember what I saw. It was about a dude on a ship. Fuck, I can't remember what it was called. It was called The Something. Oh no. I'm gonna, I have to Google it. It was like silent comedy film. I think it was 1922 on a ship. I don't have internet. Fuck! <laughs> okay, let me, <laughs> let me connect you. <laughs> Dude, how did anyone talk about anything in the 1920s? You would just have to remember shit. That'd suck. What was it called? Oh, it was Buster Keaton. That's right. Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton. Silent film. And it was about... Mm, which one was it? It's not the boat. Jeez, he's got heaps about fucking boats. What does he have? Buster Keaton ship and then spies were involved should have go oh the navigator 1924 the navigator it was fucking hilarious and it was really cool to see just just how much funny you can get out of such a limited uh format like no dialogue no sound effects no music all you have is your body and actions and occasionally text, which obviously you'd want to use sparingly because you want to watch a movie, not read a fucking book, yeah? It, it, was, it was just wild. The, the, and it was so funny, just the shit they could do. It, it made me go, you know what I had to do after seeing it? It was so inspiring after seeing it. I had to convince myself that nobody wants to see me in a silent film. I was like, man, I could do that if I spent an entire year writing and filming and directing and working out silent comedy. I could put that on YouTube. And then my rational brain was like, no, cunt, you've just seen a good movie. All right. It's not the 1920s anymore. There's a reason why there are no silent films anymore. All right. No one wants to see that shit. You're just being a fucking wanker. Sometimes you're going to have that inner voice that calls you a fucking wanker, dude. Not that good idea. No one gives a fuck about you. You're going to have that voice sometimes. Or maybe, you know, maybe, but every now and then you probably don't want that voice at all. Because some people are, you know, Kanye West, he doesn't have that voice, you know. Like, you know, every single idea Kanye has, his voice goes, yeah, you are that good. Go for it, mate. Fucking, you'll kill that. And he doesn't always. But, you know, he's got that voice. He's got that voice just egging him on. He's like, yep, you can do that. Sometimes he winds up in a mental hospital, yes. But other times, you know, we get really good albums like College Dropout. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was so good, man. I really recommend just getting on a, getting on a Google search and just ser searching like search Wurlitzer Cinema Silent Film or something in your city. I bet you can find something. It was only 30 bucks too. And man... I went with my girl and we were by at least 50 years the youngest people there. I have never felt so young in my fucking life, dude. Every single person, I reckon the youngest person was, was me, 25, and then after that, 60. Like it, it was like such a massive jump to the point where when me and my girl came in the door... There were these really ancient people taking tickets and stuff, and everyone had physical tickets. We were the only people that booked online. I saw it on their little list. Our names, nobody else. Everyone bought tickets on the day or over the phone. It was amazing, right? And we walked up, and, and it was, and it was the, the guy taking the tickets was so shocked. And he was like, oh, welcome, welcome, come inside. He was so excited. He's like, oh, my God, youth, this is amazing. And he asked me, he goes, oh, how did you guys find out about this? Because obviously he was like, oh, fuck, young people, finally, for the first time ever, we got to get more of these. And I said, oh, um, I couldn't remember. Typical me, I'm fucking that dumb. I've got tickets to this thing. Couldn't remember, remember how I found out about it. I was like, oh, I uh, just heard about it online. And he went, fuck, I don't understand how that works. Well, that doesn't help me at all. And then I got in and I sat down and I realized, oh, no, I found out about it on Facebook from their post that came up in my feed. 
that, gee, I, sh- I should have told him that. That might have helped him a little bit. <laughs> Something he could understand instead of me going, Oh, the internet! <laughs> How did you find out about us? Words! <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what I did to him. How did you find out about us? Oh, with my brain. Somehow, at some point in time. Good luck, cunt. Anyway, the, the film was amazing, but everyone there was so fucking old. This is, how, this is how old they were, right? This is how fucking old the people around us were. I heard after the film, everyone was started walking around and they and obviously they knew each other. It must have been like a monthly community thing where we all get together and we see a movie just like we used to when we were kids and the Wurlitz is playing and we see Buster Keaton the Navigator. It's all a rootin' tootin' good time. And, uh, and there's no bloody black people either. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about the movie, man. It was, you know what, the movie, you could probably find it on YouTube, I bet. The movie was really really funny and it was very good and really wholesome as well and silly but then halfway through it just got really racist without spoiling it he's on a ship and they get stranded in the middle of the ocean and then they wash ashore halfway through the film and and of course on this this beach that they wash up is just an island full of cannibals and it's the only black people in the film and it's like 60 black dudes jumping up and down really exaggerated holding spears in like leaf skirts and their first thing is just to kill the white people and I was like ah I was liking it up until then fuck man but uh and then it was just like two white people just like beating the shit out of black people for the rest of it and I was like yeah I mean, it's from the 1920s. What did I expect, you know? I was, I was lucky that only came in halfway and wasn't like the premise of the fucking film. <laughs> Actually, right at the start of the movie, he had a, 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 a black couple kissing and getting married, and that was it. That would have been crazy progressive for that time. Um, I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page for it. I bet... Uh... <laughs> I bet um, there was controversy about that fucking scene. Where are we? Um, Oh, dude, he bought the ship for it. Crazy shit. Um, Where are we? Nah, it doesn't say anything about it. Critical reception. Uh, anyway, who gives a fuck? Yeah, dude, it was the old, some of the oldest people I've ever seen in my life were there, and we were surrounded by it. This is how, this is how, this is how I knew that I'd really stepped into some old shit. I heard, I heard a conversation that I have never heard in my life, and I, and I think that I'm not going to hear again for 60 years. And I'll definitely have this conversation, and so will you. You're going to have this conversation. I'm going to have it. All of us are going to have it, but we're not meant to hear it, for 40 years. You're not meant to hear this until you're at least 70. This conversation doesn't happen until you're 70, right? I was sitting there in the movie cinema and these old people started talking to each other and and the movie finished and they were like, oh, that was a bloody riot, wasn't it? That was delightful. That was very funny. How are you going, Jim? Yes, I'm, I'm very good. Thanks, Tom. How are you, Tom? And Tom goes, oh, you, oh, you know me. I'm surviving. I'm surviving, but you know what? We do miss Bill, don't we? And then, and then Jim went, yes, we do miss Bill. Because Bill died. <laughs> like, that's just how matter of fact it is. Like, it's to the point where Bill must have been their 10th mate to go. It wasn't a tragedy. It was just so matter of fact of that's how life goes. You just fucking die and all your friends die. And the only thing you say to your other old mates is, we do miss Bill, don't we? Yes, we do. And no crying. No mourning. That's like, you're done. You, you're you done crying. When you're 70, 80 years old, you, you don't cry anymore when your mates die. You go, oh, thank fuck. That's one less birthday card I got to send out. <laughs> <laughs> man I remember hearing that conversation I was like fuck I'm not I'm not supposed to hear this for 60 years dude 
That's not a convo you have until you're at least 70. But it was good to see I have something look, to look forward to. You know, all my friends and family around me dying. <laughs> and then it's happened so often I can't even fucking care about it anymore. I'm just waiting for my turn. Okay, little bit too morbid, I, I would say. Little bit too morbid. What else we got here in the fucking notes, huh? Um. Oh, man. I watched... I watched the most fucked documentary news piece on the weekend. So... This woman who, she's on some American news service. I don't know if it's Fox or, or NBC or, or whatever the fuck it is. It's one of those, hey, we're going to do an emotional story. But because we're an American news service, we have absolutely no genuine feelings or opinions. We just smile through our Botox, impossibly, like creepy Barbie dolls who are 50 and have menopause. It's that... One of those fucking news TV shows. And fake titties as well. One of those one of those things. Hey, welcome to Fox News. Here's what I, here's what fucking Mrs. Botox and fake titties has to say about immigration. I'm here to I'm here to tell it how it is. And anyone who disagrees with me is un-American. But then NBC's just as bad. I'm here to tell it how it is, and anyone who disagrees with me is a racist. Meanwhile, some massive rich cunt is just giving both sides money and being like, hey, you guys fight, just don't talk shit about me, all right? I'm trying to sell oil and war. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so it was this fucking interview, interview story, emotional piece about... Um, sexual therapy and like naked therapy and and helping people have sex in a healthy way that that either uh have had traumatic sexual experiences in the past um you know victims of horrible things uh or if they have crazy low self-esteem or if they're incredibly disabled right so just some like just some pure amazing sex work. You know what I mean? Like, th like those are the cunts that deserve sex work. All of those sex workers, I think, are saints, right? You know when you see that cunt who takes six special kids to the movies and he's got 35 popcorns in his arms and he's trying to keep track of everyone and they're all running around in their helmets touching stuff with their sticky hands and you see that guy and you go, that guy's a fucking hero. No, he's not, okay? He would be a hero if he started sucking their dicks. <laughs> <laughs> That's when he would really reach that hero status, okay? So the real heroes in this industry are the sex workers who fuck dudes with cerebral palsy because if anyone needs a root, it's the cunt who can't get out of his fucking chair. Um, so it was, they were talking about... It, that was like mainly just a, a story with, uh, with this one particular sex worker... I wouldn't actually, I don't know if I should call her a sex worker. She was like a, I can't remember what it is. She was like a sex therapist or, or something like that. And she did this controversial uh, type of therapy that is only recommended in very, very rare cases, which was, it was like a physical touch therapy, something along the lines of that, right? It's basically, if you could think of the, I can't remember the exact term, but if you could think of the most clinical way to describe a emotionally friendly gobby, that's what it was, you know? An emotionally friendly gob. <laughs> it was like, it was it was a gobby and a hug. That's, that's what she was doing, you know? Gobby and a hug. A nice chat and a kiss. Back rub and some anal. That's what she was doing. That's her job and God bless her, okay? Um... And so what it was for was it, for, it was for people who have experienced traumatic things, uh, sexual things in their life, and maybe they're going through regular therapy and, and it's helping, but what they really need to experience is sex in a, in a safe way and safe, healthy, protected way so that they can go out and do it uh, and live their life. And they had um, this one older dude who, who was a patient of, uh, of, a normal therapist and this woman, the sex therapist, whatever her fucking name was, and uh, he had been abused as a kid, right? Very sad shit. Um, 
And what she was doing was she was just meeting up with him every couple weeks and just touching him, not even having sex, just touching him, asking if she could touch him. It was like real, really sweet, like heartbreaking stuff of this 50-year-old dude who had gone through some horrible shit in his past and he couldn't he couldn't experience physical touch normally. So the, And this woman was helping him be okay with it and to turn it from a terrifying, awful thing into a normal, healthy, positive thing, right? So he could experience, you know, love, basically. And I thought that was really, really nice. And, and uh, the whole time this is happening, there's this other female reporter, right? This female journalist. And uh, she's tagging along and watching it all and giving her own comment. And it's, it's like her segment, whatever. And it's, go- it's going really well and it's really nice. And then, uh, <laughs> and then they get to the next person after this 50-year-old dude. The next person who's this woman's client is uh, a really disabled guy. Uh, he's got cerebral palsy um, and he can't walk properly. His, his body's a little bit, you know... He's got cerebral palsy. So obviously he's incredibly self-conscious about his body because not only does it look different, it also doesn't work like a a regular person's body. So he's obviously, you know, understandably quite self-conscious about it. And this woman is helping him work through that by, uh, with this touch therapy, right? And this journalist, I have never seen a more selfish thing in my fucking entire life. So this dude with cerebral palsy, first session, first session with the woman, he's incredibly bravely agreed to let a journalist in and to let a film crew in to see his first physical touch therapy with this person, which is an obviously incredibly sensitive topic, right? So the sex therapist, what she decides to do is as their first session, both of them get naked, stand in front of a mirror and describe their bodies. They talk about what they like, what they don't like, what they wish they could change, and just look at their bodies and try to accept them, right? Which obviously, for a dude with who has a disabled body, would be very helpful for him to accept and love his body, right? Great idea. This journalist, whole time, standing there in clothes. So the first woman, she takes her clothes off, she points out, Oh, I like me tits, they're pretty good, little bit saggy, but oh well, I'm... 30 or whatever, I like my shoulders, I like my armpit hair, I like my pussy lips, just all, whatever she's doing, right, just going through her fucking body, I like this, I don't like that, and then the guy with cerebral palsy, he stands up, and very bravely takes all of his clothes off in front of the therapist, the camera crew, the journalist woman, and looks in the mirror, and starts describing and pointing at his body, and he has a lot of negative things to say, it's quite sad, right? He points out, I don't like this. I don't like that. This looks strange. I hate these. Just a massive list of things that he doesn't like. And it was this really like touching, sad moment of, oh man, that must be so hard to live in a body that doesn't work the way you want it to, right? And everyone's crying. He's crying. The woman, the sex therapist is like really encouraging and going, go on, what do you like? Surely you like something. I like this about you. You know, real wholesome stuff, right? Then, the journalist woman interrupts the dude with cerebral palsy and goes, Hey guys, I know this is your session, but I want to try. Bitch, you're a journalist. Fuck off. This is not your session. There's this dude with fucking cerebral palsy having his first ever session, he's brave enough to let you film it for a story to spread the positive word of loving your body and accepting it. And then this fucking selfish journalist is like, I want to go. Can I have a go? Bitch, it's not a fucking ride. You don't get a turn. What is this, a board game? This isn't bop it, bitch. This is therapy. Bop it. Twist it. No, fuck off, right? And then the sex therapist is like, ah, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess, whatever. The dude with cerebral palsy says nothing, so you know he's not happy about it. He's like, oh, fuck, I was just about to say that I liked my eyes and this journo bitch is interrupting me. Fuck, man. And anyway, this journo, she 
takes her fucking clothes. She doesn't even ask for this. She doesn't even, she doesn't even wait for them to say yes. She just takes all her fucking clothes off. By the way, in front of her cameraman, who's probably her colleague, if I did that, that'd be some me too shit. My career would be over in 10 seconds with a fucking tweet. It'd be like, yeah, look, I was filming this really heartwarming story about a man with cerebral palsy, but then Lewis Spears just got his dick out and started waving it in front of everyone, talking about how much he loves it. Bro, I'd be me too the fuck out of the journalism industry, but because she's got tits, she's allowed to do it. Anyway, she takes all her clothes off, and she basically just pushes this dude with cerebral palsy out of the way. Out of the way, spazzo! pushes it back on the bed, and then she starts looking at her body and going through everything she likes and doesn't like. And you know what made it even worse? She had heaps of positive shit to say. I love my titties. I love my eyes. I love my hair. Yeah, bitch, because you paid for them and you got a makeup team. Fuck. And your body works. Right? And she's listing off all these things about her body, and to the guy... (laughs) To the dude's credit, you know, I am making it sound like maybe it was a bad experience for him. But you got to remember, this dude's a virgin. He's gone from seeing never kissing a girl, never falling in love, to all of a sudden sitting in a room with like two naked 9 out of 10s. Like he's moving quick. That's 0 to 100 real fucking quick. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started from a chair, now I'm about to fuck a therapist and a journo. Like, he's killing it, man. I've never seen two naked chicks in the same place. I mean, I can run, but still. (laughs) Anyway, right? So, so she's listing all the things that she likes about her body. And then, then she says, in front of these two people, she's like, oh, I just had a baby, so I don't really like my stomach area. Uh, In fact, my husband hasn't seen me naked for months. Bro, if I was the husband, I would be so fucking mad. How is work, honey? Because she didn't plan it. She didn't plan it at all, right? So she would come home from work. I'm the husband. I'm probably a house husband because she'd be making millions working for this massive news company, right? I've spent all day slaving over the kitchen. You know, I'm a new ge- I'm, I'm the new generation type of husband, right? I stay at home. I'm a stay-at-home dad. I cook for the family. I've got a tiny penis and low testosterone. I'm going bald, but at least my wife is a strong woman. And I'm like, hey, honey, how was work today? And she kicks down the fucking door. She's like, yo, what up, beta husband? How was work? Yeah, it was really good. I know I haven't fucked you for two months, but you know what I did? I did get naked in front of two strangers, one of them being a sex worker, the other one being some dude I've never met before. And everyone looked at my tits and it was really, really uh, great. No, you can't see them. What's for dinner? (laughs) Like, man... So fucked, right? So this, this chick, she just completely takes over this guy's sexual therapy session, starts talking about her own problems, shows her tits to two strangers and a co-worker, and for some reason everyone's like, oh, that's amazing journalism, amazing journalism. No, it's not. Okay? Amazing journalism is reporting on the story, not jumping into the middle of it. Like, what the fuck? That'd be like if she went out to go and report on the absolutely devastating crisis of female genital mutilation, and halfway through the story, when she's filming it being done, she's like, Oi, can I have a go? Give me the scalpel. Oi, oh, you don't have a scalpel? You've only got rusty scissors? Whatever, I'll give it a crack. You're not the story, bitch. Just report on it. Fuck. Anyway, what was I talking about? What else have I done this week? Oh, that's right. I've because uh, comedy festival on all of the all the boys are down uh, from all across the country doing shows and stuff. Um, I have started to film a bunch of shit uh, that'll be coming out over the next few months because I'm going to America in May and my plan is to just go full stand-up comedy mode. But I don't want to leave you guys without videos, so I'm just pre-filming stuff. Um, so got two episodes of Cooking Without Instructions in the fucking bank. 
which is good. The the one episode is being filmed, and I already know it's going to be the season finale. It's with a guest that I will not reveal, but holy fuck, it is chaos, and it's so funny. Um, and it goes for half an hour. We, it's so funny and so fucking good, I can't cut it down. It goes for half an hour, it'll be season finale, whatever. Um, I've also uh, been filming uh, a bunch of videos. Filmed, filmed uh, what was it, two, two or three videos with Frenchy, uh, Isaac Butterfield. I'm going to get some in the bank with Fairbarn Films Boys. Uh, I know you guys have been asking for lots of collabs, especially with, with Isaac, because um, I've never worked with him before. So uh, that'll be great. And th- they are great. We've got them in the bank. They're just being edited at the moment. Uh, I've also got a bunch in the bank with Luke Kidgel. And uh, yeah, it's all going really, really well, man. I'm also going to get some podcasts, hopefully with all of those people. So I've done Luke. I want to get Frenchy, Isaac, the Fairbarn boys. And um, I think that may be all. Maybe some other people will see who comes. Um, so it's all going very, very well, man. The uh, the content banking up is fucking happening. And of course, if you want to see all of these videos uh, when they're done, as opposed to when they eventually come out, they'll all be on Patreon early. So make sure you fucking jump on there. Um, another thing I want to plug, because I haven't said it for a while. Uh, a lot of people ask me when I'm performing live. It's not going to be until the end of the year that I do my tour. Uh, but if you want to find out about shows before anyone else and you want to guarantee, well, borderline guarantee yourself. Okay, <laughs> maybe not guarantee. Guarantee that you get the chance to buy tickets before the general public. Uh, chuck your email and your city into losespears.com slash gig list. That's how you find out first about my shows and about any special cool shit I have coming up. I don't send emails more than once a month, if that. I think I've sent, I haven't even sent one this year, I don't think. Uh, I, I, I hate spam and shit, so I only send them when I have something to say. Uh, and I always make them funnier too. So if you want to find out about shows and stuff, losespears.com slash gig list is the best way uh, to find out about shows and to ensure that you get the first chance at grabbing them. Um, what else here? What else we got here? Man, I found out uh, that something really interesting. I was reading this story that uh, Gucci, the clothing brand, makes no money on their clothes. They don't make a profit on their fucking clothing. Like that t-shirt they, they sell for $500, they don't make a profit on. Isn't that fucking wild? It makes sense when you when you think about it. You got to think about it a lot, though. I was doing this research, so and all of the luxury brands are like this. So like Gucci, Louis Vuitton, all of them are like this. They don't make any money on their clothes. They actually lose money on their clothes. They're what's called a loss leader. So uh, you put it out, you make a loss on it, but it encourages people to buy things that you do make money on. So for example, my videos and my podcast massive loss leader. But hopefully, when people like them, they'll sign up to the gig list, loosebeers.com slash gig list, and buy some tickets to a show, and that's how I can feed my kids. Hopefully. But just, unfortunately, it's about a fucking 10-month run-up until tickets go on sale, so I'm just chucking, for the whole 10 months of the year, I'm throwing money into the hole, being like, fuck, I hope this comes back out at one day. Um, but yeah, they lose money on their clothes. They, they actually only really make a profit on their smaller shit. So like their their wallets and accessories and their perfumes and their bags, right? Which is fucking crazy, but it makes sense, right? All of these all of these luxury brands, they all get manufactured in Italy by the most skilled people in the world. So that's a huge expense. They're probably designed by the most uh, talented designers in the world. That's a massive expense. But the big one, oh, they got to pay rent at their stores, they've got to fit out their stores. If you've ever seen the outside of one of these luxury stores, it looks like a fucking palace, right? Like, it looks like they would have to be open and profitable for 10 years just to pay for the fucking sign out the front. <clears throat> and, uh, and, then, and then after that, right, all of those expenses or whatever, but everything they don't sell, right, and they, they refresh their seasons what, every season, so fucking four times a year or whatever they do, every new season, they can't do sales. They can't do sales. They can't do half off. They can't do, you know, final item sales because if they did sales, everyone would just wait for that, you know? So if they don't sell something while it's in season, they fucking burn it. 
Isn't that insane? They just burn it. Because if they didn't burn it, the stuff would not be exclusive and then cunts wouldn't buy it to wear the brand name. I mean, I'm not one to talk because I fucking love that shit. Um, but it, man, it's so, it's so interesting just reading all about that stuff. Yeah, they don't make any money on their clothes. They only make money on their fucking wallets and hats and, and all the little shit that's actually cheaper, and, but they sell more of. Very fucking interesting shit. Um, all right, what else? Oh, right. I might do miscellaneous bit at the end here. I think it's about time for that. Um, and then i got to go and uh, head into the festival and see some shows. Oh, uh, on that note, um, I might recommend a few shows that I've seen so far. Luke Kidgel's show is very good. Um, I also saw Alex Williamson's show. was fucking so funny, man. He's, he's good, dude. That dude makes me angry how naturally funny he is. Like the videos that he'll upload on Facebook, which to him are clearly just him filming himself, just bullshitting, making stuff up on the fly. And to me, it's some of the funniest shit I've seen online. He's so fucking funny. It makes me angry. Um, and his show was really, really good. He's got this, I don't, I'm not going to spoil it, but he has an incredible bit on mass shootings. That's just so fucked and dark, but so undeniably funny. Like he says the premise of it, the whole crowd of a thousand people go, no way, man, that's not funny. But then he then he, he chucks the rope out and he goes, yes, it is. And just reels it in. And it's like, bang, bang, bang. So fucking funny. So go see Alex Williamson if you get the chance. I think he's touring as well, not just in Melbourne. Uh, another show I saw last night was Nick Kappa. Very, very funny shit. He's been on the Luke and Lewis radio show. Uh, that's in a smaller one as well, and it's a little bit weird. Uh, it's got uh, some non-conventional uh, stand-up in there that's very, very, very funny. Uh, he calls himself Australia's premier agricultural comedian, so if you're into that shit, uh, go and see it. If you want something different, it was very funny. Uh, who else have I seen? <clears throat> that's all. I am going to see Chris Waynehouse. I'm going to see Frenchie. I'm going to see... Isaac Butterfield, I haven't seen him yet, waiting for a weekend because I want to see it when the show's packed. Um, and, you know, I'll let you know next week who else I see that's good. I'll be seeing shows fucking every night. Uh, and you never know when you'll see me. Where are we? Oh, that's right, I'm doing fucking emails, idiot. Okay. If you would like to send an email into the podcast, if you have a life advice question, if you have uh, a funny story you think I would like, or just anything that you'd like to contribute to the podcast, really, send an email to podcast at lewspears.com. That's podcast at lewspears.com. Summarize it in the fucking uh, uh, subject line, and uh, I'll get back to you. Okay. Friend of seven years told me to fuck off. Oh, brutal. Been through this one. Um, hey, Lou, I've got a probably petty situation for you. A friend of mine has for the past few years gotten progressively more and more depressed to the point where she's barely able to leave her house. I've been trying to speak to her just to get her to go for a drive or just to have a chat and nothing has worked. Eventually, this led me to speaking to her over Discord and her telling me to leave her the fuck alone. It's been a few weeks since this happened and I feel terrible because I feel like I'm abandoning my friend and I'm concerned for her well-being. So what should I do? Should I leave her alone, not speak to her anymore or should I wait a few months and try again? She's been my best friend all throughout high school uh, and after <clears throat> and I wanted your opinion. Thanks for reading this. Have a good one. Man, cr fucking crazy shit because... This has ha almost exactly happened to me, minus the depression thing. I had a, a, a really good friend in primary school going into high school, and halfway through high school, she didn't want to be friends with me anymore because uh, I was not cool. She and she, I, I don't know, I don't know what, probably a bunch of dip reasons going on uh, in her, and it was h horrible and devastating for me because I was really friends with her. Um, didn't even want to fuck her. <laughs> I was just really good friends with her and she was kind of my only friend that I retained from primary school going into high school and I really wanted to be friends with her. She did not want to be friends with me and no matter how much I fucking tried, she did not want to be friends with me and neither did any of her friends in the, in the new group that she went from 
from friends with us to friends with a new group didn't want to be friends with me and and there was nothing I could do about it and then we just separated and uh didn't speak she was my friend for would have been five years maybe four or five years uh and literally last night I hung out with her and it was great we'd both grown up uh she said a few nice things about those times and we rekindled it and we hung out last night and it was lovely um so some man sometimes people just fucking this is the best case scenario sometimes people just disconnect from you because maybe they don't want to be friends with you maybe they've grown out of you or they're going through some shit that that they don't want you around to to go through and sometimes it's just a case of you can't control that so maybe you should let it go because I fucking I spent I put myself through two years of hell trying to rekindle a friendship that just wasn't there anymore and I and it stressed me out and then I didn't make friends with other people because I was putting all my fucking energy into this dead friendship that was that was just ended out of my control I wanted it to happen they didn't want it to happen I, I kept trying to break my way into this fucking friendship group that did not want anything to do with me. And then I, and then after fucking two years of trying to do that, I had no friends. And I was like, fuck. I, I put so much energy into these people that were not receiving that energy that all of the people that were putting energy into me gave up. And then I was left with nothing. Uh, and then it took me fucking two more years to make some really good friends. And now I'm great. And then fucking would have been what? Almost seven, eight years since the friendship ended. They've come back into my life. And it was really nice. You know, we're going to see each other again. That's cool. Um, so, But that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, your friend is very, very depressed uh, and cutting themselves off from other people is such a common, that's like the number one thing. And that's the worst thing that she could do is cut herself off from the rest of the world because she's depressed, which makes her more depressed, which makes her cut people off more, which makes her more depressed. And then she's stuck in the fucking spiral downwards. Um, but again, this is her life and, and you cannot help someone who does not want to help themselves. Um, it sounds like you've been trying and trying and trying and she's just pushing you out and some people can't be helped. Uh, what I have done, I've cut people off who have done that and they've turned out all right. They've come back good and it had nothing to do with me or they've also stayed where they were and it's had nothing to do with me. And I've also tried to, to pull these people out of the darkness and out of the mud. And they're, they're, that is your responsibility as a friend, to help your friends. But also, there is a limit. There's a limit to how much you can do. There's a limit to how much you can help. There is a limit to how much you should uh, hurt yourself to save someone else who maybe doesn't want to be saved or isn't helping themselves. You know what I mean? There's a limit to how much energy you should, you can put into another person without it just not helping them, but harming you. Um, so I would, it could be this thing of a friend of seven years. You look like a young dude. Maybe she's just grown up and grown out of you, which is hard. And it's generally never reciprocal, but maybe that's what's happened. Uh, or maybe she's just going through a really rough time. Uh, I think what I would do in this situation is I would give her her space and I would let her know that I'm giving her that space. I would say, hey, understand that you don't want anything to do with me, but I want you to know I will always be here. I fucking love you. I really care about you. And I would also, if she's Australian, I would recommend <clears throat> and let her know that she can get free th therapy. All she needs to go is to go to a GP. Uh, and tell them that she's depressed and she's struggling, they will prescribe her free therapy um, that she doesn't have to pay for. She'll get, I think she gets three or four sessions or whatever. Therapy's fucking really helpful, even if she, even if you're really young. People think that therapy is only for like old rich people. It's not. It's for young people. They also think it's for people who are exclusively in crisis or crazy people. Nah. 
everyone should do therapy because it's it just gives you skills of how to uh, regulate yourself. I did it when I was younger, when I was going through all that horrible shit, when I was like a teen, and I reckon it made me who I am. Um, <clears throat> so I would just say, hey, I understand that you don't want me around. I think you're going through some rough stuff. I'm really sorry. I want you to know I'm totally here for you. Message me anytime and I will, I will be there. Uh, here's some resources for you. I think that this could be good for you. Whenever you're ready to reach out, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll message you uh, in a month or in two months or whatever. Uh, and then just just let it sit. If you think she's in like actual crisis, like danger, close to doing something or hurting themselves, definitely worth uh, reporting that to... You know, you can call, you can, I don't know, this is, this is worst, worst case scenario, but you can call the suicide hotline and ask them what to do about your friend. Um, that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, man, good luck. I think it could, it's, it's I'm, I don't mean to scare you by giving you all those fucking worst, worst case scenarios, but it's also good to know because someone listening may be dealing with that, whereas you may not be. Um, so good luck, man. All right. How long do we have here? How long are we going for? Uh, 48. What's the time? Ooh, I gotta go in a bit. Um, all right. Okay. Okay. Revenge story. Piss in my dad's motorbike helmet. I like this one. I love a good revenge story. Okay. Hey, Lewis, you shit cunt. I'm Nat, and my boyfriend and Scott and I absolutely love your stuff. Your recent Sydney show was incredible. Thank you very much as was the comedy special, and I'm really loving all your content on YouTube. Oh, a bit of a oh, suck for me. Thank you very much. Anyway, <laughs> here's the backstory. My dad, who we will now refer to as shit cunt, is the biggest... I thought I was shit cunt. Hey, 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 hey. You try and call me daddy. Um, My dad, as we will now refer to as shit cunt, is the biggest shit cunt imaginable. A fat, old, rich asshole that cheated on my mum for most of their marriage. He's married to a 20-something... Whoa! A 20-something-year-old bitch that leeches off him like fuck Jerry leeches off content creators. Man, that's crazy. He fucking married one of your mates, basically. That's fucking wild. So, my two brothers and I see him about once a year when shit cunt comes back to Australia, mainly to try and get some free things. Oh, you see him to get free stuff. He spends most of the time talking about his rich life, especially his Harley Davidson motorbike. One night, my dad meets one of my two brothers to see a movie and... Oh, you've written it in all caps. <laughs> one, <laughs> one night, my dad meets one of my two bros. I didn't pick up on that. Okay, I've got to read this part again. So me and my two bros, and I see him about once a year when my dad comes to Australia. One night, my dad meets one of my two bros to see a movie and parks his motorbike on the street outside the movie theater. My stepdad, who's a mad cunt, brought up the idea of messing with his bike somehow. Uh, so we started brainstorming. The boys decided one of them should piss on the bike but that it would have to be from a bottle because it was an open an open area with security cameras. My mum heard us and we thought she would shut the operation down, but surprisingly says, give me the bottle, I'm going to piss in it too. Fuck, poor cunt. We ended up with a full bottle. So my brother, my stepdad, and dude, your mum must have the most accurate cunt of all time. What is she like, a fucking pussy sniper? We ended up getting a full bottle. So my brother, my stepdad and I headed to the shops in all black. Real Mission Impossible shit. We pulled up to the street where the bike was parked and my stepdad jumped out with the Powerade bottle filled to the brim with our piss. My brother and I waited for 20 minutes before my stepdad returned with the bottle empty. We had done it. But the bike was not covered in piss. Not that... Not that Oh, the bike was not covered in piss. That would be too easy to not notice. It could just roll off onto the floor. Yeah, you could. You would just not notice that. It would just be like rain or something. Instead, my stepdad had emptied the entire bottle of piss into my dad's helmet as well as his 20-year-old bitch of a wife's helmet. <laughs> oh, no! The next time my brothers and I saw our dad, we mentioned he had 
new helmets and almost imploded trying not to laugh as he explained that he had to get new ones as there was some weird smelling liquid that was in the helmets that would not wash out. So he put them on. Oh no, that's fucking brutal. He put the helmets on. And that means that, dude, that means that he put the helmets on heaps, right? Because it's like he put them on, he's like, oh, fuck, my helmet's all wet. That's a bit strange. And then he let it dry out, whatever, kept wearing it. He's like, fuck, my helmet smells like piss. He would have worn that helmet like five fucking times. That's amazing. Not only did he mention the weird smell, but he said it was so bad, he had to drive straight from the movie theater to the store to buy two new ones. That's so funny. The nearest store to buy motorcycle helmets is 30 minutes away. And as we all know, it's illegal to ride up on a bike without a helmet on. He had to wear the helmet the whole way. That is so funny. Any ideas for our next revenge plan? Have a shit one, Nat. You know what, Nat? Nah, tell your dad to message me. He needs to get revenge on you, cunts. I think you win. Fuck, that's funny. You pissed his helmet. Yeah, oh, that's so funny. He had to wear it the whole way. Fuck, that's funny. Um, hey, <laughs> amazing. Thank you very much for listening. That's the end of the podcast, guys. I'm um, about to play a little clip from the Me and Mike podcast, which is exclusive to Patreon. It won't be anywhere else. So if you want to... Uh, uh, see me live loosespears.com slash giglist if you want to support what I do and get early access to every single piece of content I put out um, sometimes as early as, as months beforehand it is patreon.com slash loosespears uh, to check out here is an excerpt uh, a moment from the new me and Mike podcast episode 3 that is only on Patreon I hope you guys enjoy it I will talk to you guys next Sunday and I hope you have a shit one Steve, can you stop annoying Luke? He's trying to work for free at my warehouse without paying me rent. You uh, asked me to be here! Oh, why did I ask you to be here? Because you took my bathroom key! Yeah, so stop shitting. <laughs> Sorry, Liz. I've had enough of this. <laughs> oh, no. No, you're wrecking my hair. I've got to fucking do a thing tonight. Alright, I'm wrapping Lewis up in tape. Sorry, guys. This is just how it's got to be. I'm taping us together because you're not, because and you're taping us together. Oh God, it's all over my arm hair. Well, you know what? That's your problem. You're Italian, so you're way hairier than ah! I am. Ah, so, sorry guys. Well, are we not being taped together anymore. Oh yeah, we can be, just not on my arm. Okay, well, okay. Well, then maybe you tape my arm to your leg. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> ah, <okay. laughs> oh, oh, that's all the tape. That's all the tape. Is it? Oh, no, it's not. It's... Oh, no, it's not. Just. One of those tape things. Do you think this is interesting for the people to see? Um, no, but oh. it's interesting for me. Yeah. Do you think that when when I was like, "Oi, we should do a podcast," do you think that it, that episode, our second episode, which is well, actually episode, episode three, yeah. would have? No, it's our second episode, but it's episode three. Yeah. Do second. you think? Well, actually, that's a lie. We recorded episode two. We're just not releasing it. Yeah. Um, do you think that it would have ended with me taping, well, you taping my arm to your leg? A little bit. Yeah. I actually had this idea. Yeah. Like, why don't we like? Tape each other up or yeah. tape our heads together. Oh, oh I'm really itchy. Let's tape. <laughs> Ow. I'm just really itchy. Okay, sorry. <laughs> 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 Thanks, man. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is. So we do the rest of the podcast like this? Yeah, I think we should. Well, we've only.